Welcome to the Common Man Football Show. My name is James Coburn. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about Derek Carr, uh, the quarterback from the Oakland Raiders. Uh, we're going to be looking at his analytics. Specifically, we're going to be looking at his high school production, his college production, and then, of course, his NFL production uh, to come to the ultimate conclusion of is he worth all the money the Raiders are going to pay him because they are ultimately going to make him the highest paid uh, NFL player uh, and also the highest paid uh, quarterback in the NFL. And uh, the main question that everybody's asking and talking about is, is he worth all that money? Uh, and we'll get into a little bit of that at the very end in terms of how do you value these sort of contracts and stuff like that. Uh, but the bottom line is we're just going to look at his production at the high school level, the college level, see how he translated to the NFL level, and then ultimately come to some sort of conclusion about how you should view Derek Carr going into the future and if the Raiders overpaid or underpaid or all that kind of stuff. Uh, so those are the main topics we're going to be getting into and now let's get to his high school and college production. So when it comes to Derek Carr's uh, high school production score and just to explain this a little bit more, the high school production score takes into account touchdown to interception ratio and completion percentage compared to all of his peers at the high school level uh, since the 2007 NFL draft class. And the sample has over 6,000 prospects in total, uh, soon to be 7,000 uh, because there's going to be another uh, group of high school players added to the sample. Uh, but it's a huge sample size. And it goes back to the 2007 NFL draft because, one, that's just how far I could go. But I felt like it was a large enough sample size, there's enough sort of things to draw from it. Uh, and again, it, it's ranking a player based on how they perform to their peers. And when it comes to Derek Carr's case, uh, his high school production score was a 94.94 out of 100, uh, which is elite. I mean, it's a it's a elite high school production score. Uh, when it comes to Pro Bowl quarterbacks, every single Pro Bowl quarterback, multiple Pro Bowl quarterback drafted since 2007 had at least 84 or higher uh, Pro Bowl production score. And every starter had at least a 69 or higher uh, high school production score. And Derek Carr happened to have, you know, above that. He met the Pro Bowl threshold. You know, he's above the minimum or at least the last, uh, the bare minimum in terms of Pro Bowl quarterback. So he's well above that with 94.94 out of 100. And when you look at his college production, or FBS production specifically, uh, this does the same method as the high school production, but it adds a layer of strength of schedule to the mix. Uh, so to basically explain it, it's the same sort of concepts of touchdown to interception, touch on interception ratio, completion percentage, but adds a layer of strength of schedule uh, because if a player plays at Alabama versus Fresno State, like how do you quantify that? How do you do that? And I figured that strength of schedule was a good sort of barometer to see how much or how good their production was for their level of competition. Uh, and it's turned out to be a very good weight, uh, a very good sort of addition, uh, just because it gives you some specifics in terms of if you have a guy in the MAC or you have a guy in Derek Carr's case who was in the Mount West Conference. Uh, it gives you sort of a good barometer in terms of how well they should be performing in that particular conference compared to other players who came out of lesser conferences and ended up being good football players. Because uh, obviously there, there have been starting quarterbacks, two elite quarterbacks that came from not the best strength of schedules. You know, they didn't play the best uh, strength of schedules. Probably the best example uh, would probably be Steve Young in the 80s. You know, BYU strength of schedule was just not that great. It wasn't that great compared to places like Michigan and Ohio State and all those places in the 80s. Uh, but he still had a, uh, a complete QB stat score, at least an FBS score, that was in the 90 percentile because he was just so good that 
even though it was a poor schedule, he was, you know, he, he it was kind of a good barometer, if you will, so in terms of strength of schedule. And based on this data, to get more specifically, uh, Derek Carr scored an 82.06 out of 100 when it came to his FBS production. That was the best single season performance he had was 82.06, which hits at least the bare minimum uh, for uh, the majority of Pro Bowl quarterbacks uh, since the 1958 NFL draft class. And I say 1958, I say bare minimum majority at least because there have been guys uh, like Brett Favre who scored about a 50 out of 100, a 54 out of 100. Uh, there also have been, of course, Michael Vick who scored about a 76 out of 100. And then the other quarterback, Drew Bledsoe, as well. He was a guy who scored about 68 out of 100. But that was only three quarterbacks uh, out of, you know, I mean, we're talking like 90% of most Pro Bowl quarterbacks hit at least 80 or higher when it comes to FPS production. That's kind of the basic way to think about that stat. Uh, and Derek Carr met that. 82.06 meets that standard. And when you look at those things combine the high school and the FBS production. It's clear from the data that he had he was a Pro Bowl potential quarterback. You know, if we went back to the 2014 NFL draft class and you just looked at the data, you would come away going, you know what, Derek Carr has a pretty good chance uh, because of his high school production and his college production of becoming a Pro Bowl level quarterback. And so far, he has made a couple trips to the Pro Bowl, and he may make another and the sort of assumption is that he will make another appearance, which I'm pretty sure will probably happen. Uh, but uh, basically, everything from his high school to his college is pass. He passed everything uh, in terms of a guy who you should consider a very good, above average NFL quarterback, essentially, based on his high school and his college production. Next up, we have his NFL uh, production, and with this, we're going to be looking at a bunch of different stats, uh, because people have talked, I've seen a lot of criticism, criticisms, uh, uh, criticisms about Derek Carr when it comes to yards per attempt, uh, you know, all these kinds of things, and let, we'll just get into the facts of every single stat, what he performs really well in, what he doesn't perform so well in, and what stats matter, and all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the bottom line is when you look at his, the one number I really like to look at is the total QB stat at the NFL level. That stat in particular takes into account touchdown to interception ratio, completion percentage, yards per attempt, adjusted yards per attempt, and quarterback rating. And it, it works off a 10-year sample. So you're comparing quarterbacks within an era of play, a 10-year sample of play. And I just like to use that particular stat because it's a good way to compare past players and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, but the bottom line is, when you look at Derek Carr's career, there was obviously was some doubts about him. Uh, you know, in 2014, uh, his total QB stat score was a 14.53 out of 100, which is not exactly that impressive when you think about it. You know, he he was not uh, he didn't come into the NFL and have like a Dan Marino esque year essentially uh, and we'll get into some reasons as to why that might be uh, but the bottom line is, is he wasn't a guy who just entered the NFL and then boom was amazing uh, but he's gotten better every single season that he's been in the NFL uh, in 2015 he ended up with the 57.7 uh, well 56.17 total QB set score in 2016 his highest season you know his best season he had a 71.82 total QB stat score uh, and on top of that his touchdown to interception plus completion percentage uh, those two specific metrics he had a 82.79 out of 100 when it came to those two very specific metrics uh, scores uh, so he's performed very well in his career in the last three years and he's gotten better every year he's played in the NFL uh, with the only sort of issues in yards per attempt. It is true that his yards per attempt have never really been that great. Uh, in 2014, he had a 2.48 score in terms of yards per attempt, uh, you know, one of the lowest in a 10-year span. 
In 2015 and 2016, he had a below average uh, uh, yards per attempt uh, with 46.27 and 44.86. He's never had great yards per attempt, but he has had good adjusted yards per attempt where he had a 71.65 adjusted yards per attempt in 2016 and a 61.18 uh, in 2015. Uh, so his raw yards per attempt is not that great. It's, a, it's below average, but his adjusted yards per attempt have been above average. And I would also say that the things that he has been amazing in is in his touchdown to interception ratio and his completion percentage uh, scores. You know, his touchdown to interception ratio with a 95.33 last year was one of the best in the NFL. And the way to think about the touchdown to interception ratio, just to just to give it a sense of real world or applicable football application, I guess, is the fact of the matter is when you turn the football over, you're decreasing your chances to win football games. Uh, and I'm actually going to do a video on this just about how turnovers and tur how turnover ratios affect actual on-field performance. But the bottom line is, is most data points to the fact that when you turn the football over, you're increasing your chances to lose football games, period. And it makes sense because every time you turn the football over, you're giving your opponent an opportunity to score, an opportunity to put points on the board that you were going to put points on the board with. And the fact that you have a quarterback who scores that well on that metric explains why the Oakland Raiders have had as much success as they've had up to this point. Uh, because you have a quarterback who's not turning the football over and as a result of not turning the football over is making sure that that offense is not giving more opportunities uh, to the opposing team's offense to make plays, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I would say Derek Carr has done really well when it comes to his NFL career. He's not exactly, again, he's not Dan Marino. Uh, he's not like a generational quarterback based on the data right now. Uh, you know, he, he still has a ways to go, a ways to improve. Uh, but I do think that there's a lots of positives in terms of his production up to this point, especially the fact that he's gotten better every single year. You know, he's 25 years old, by the way. You know, well, he's going to be 26 this, this uh, in 2017, but super young player and is only going to get better. Uh, so there's lots of positives, you know, when it comes to his production. On top of the fact that he compares pretty favorably to a guy that everybody loves, or at least used to love, and Andrew Luck. Uh, when you look at Andrew Luck from 2012 to 2014, his first three seasons, his total QB stat score in, tw in 2012 was a 26.50, about as bad as Derek Carr. Uh, his total QB stat score in 49.63 uh, wasn't even as good as Derek Carr in 2015, and in 2016, uh, he had a better uh, Q, total QB stat score of 76.50 out of 100. Uh, but what mainly rose it was his yards per attempt and, you know, stuff like that. Like, the stats that really helped Andrew Luck out is just that in his third year, he became much better in terms of yards per attempt and adjusted yards per attempt uh, than Derek Carr did in 2016. Um, so... And we'll get into some reasons as, as to why in the next sort of section of this video. Uh, but I just wanted to point that fact out that Andrew Luck is a guy that people love. Derek Carr is a guy who some people love, some people hate. But the bottom line is they're very similar when it comes to their career paths. I mean, these are guys who kind of developed. You know, they, they were kind of eh as a rookie in terms of their stats on paper. And then they slowly got better and slowly got better. Uh, one got better in terms of yards per attempt while the other just got super better, or at least really amazing when it comes to, you know, uh, making sure that he's not turning the football over and his completion percentage is also kind of going up as well. Uh, so they kind of, they kind of increase certain stats differently, but I do think that you should commend both and view both careers as similar up to this point uh, because of those specific similarities in terms of the amount of time it took them to develop and those other sort of things. Now let's get to yards per attempt, uh, which is the bane of Derek Carr's existence. Uh, most of the criticisms of him have revolved on how low his yards per attempt are. And we'll get into some reasons. Now most of the reasons are not going to be analytics based. Most of the analytics sort of uh, debate I'm going to have is just the fact of 
what's more important, these stats or yards per attempt, uh, is kind of what my main argument is going to revolve around. But anybody who's watched the Oakland Raiders or seen the Oakland Raiders or even looked at PFF grades knows that the interior offensive line is great. The tackles are not great. Um, Donald Penn has been serviceable, but he's also been injured. They've had to deal with injuries. Uh, they've had Mendelik Watson starting at a tackle spot at one point. They had Vidal Alexander starting. I mean, just look at Vidal Alexander's feet and pass protection, guys, early on this season. It's just yucky. And, and just to show the athlete, like, athleticism. This is Mendelik Watson when it comes to his athleticism. This is Vidal Alexander when it comes to his athleticism. This is Austin Howard when it comes to his athleticism. Uh, the Raiders have just simply not had great offensive tackle talent uh, or just raw athletic ability at the tackle position. And I still want to do a study on this specifically, but I really do think that yards per attempt is really just a nature of, because of that issue, because of the fact that the tackles are just not that amazing, you have to get rid of the football quickly. You have to be more up-tempo. You have to get rid of the ball um, as fast as possible because you're not going to have as much time as you think you're going to have. And as a result, you're not going to have plays develop down the field as much. Uh, you know, because again, if you have more time in the pocket, uh, you, you're giving yourself more time to make plays down the field, you know, to make bigger plays, to increase your yards per attempt, essentially, uh, you know, if you were in that sort of situation. But Derek Carr just hasn't had that opportunity yet. And I just think a lot of this stat right here is not necessarily a deficiency when it comes to Derek Carr as much as a deficiency when it comes to the offensive scheme that they're running in Oakland, uh, which is very much a, you know, get rid of the football as fast as possible, quick, up-tempo kind of attack, if you will. Um, so I don't really think that this is on the quarterback as much as on the other parts, whether it's with play calling, uh, the offensive tackles, and all this other sort of stuff. But the other thing I just wanted to get when it comes to yards per attempt is based on the data that I've done since the 1958 NFL draft class, yards per attempt and adjusted yards per attempt at the college level has become less important than touchdown to interception ratio and completion percentage. Uh, the importance, uh, you know, basically when you look at this, this sheet right here, this is looking at the percentage of guys with above average yards per attempt above average adjusted yards per attempt, above average 10 yard splits. And basically it looks at successful quarterbacks and it looks at the percentages to see, okay, where did the majority of the quarterbacks lie? Did they have, did the majority of successful quarterbacks have an above average touchdown interception ratio? Did they have an above average adjusted yards per attempt, yards per attempt? Did they have an above average quarterback rating? And based on the data here, From 2000 to 2016, the importance of yards per attempt, essentially the percentage of successful quarterbacks with a above average high, you know, uh, completion percentage and above average touchdown interception ratio, that success rate increased by about four to five percent uh, from 2000 to 2015 compared to 1958 to 2016, essentially, and. The basic way to kind of think about that is that back in the olden days, yards per attempt was, you know, a pretty important stat because a lot of times, you know, they're trying to push the ball down the football field, uh, you know, in the sort of olden times of the NFL. Uh, now everything is more West Coast based. We've become more up-tempo, short passing, you know, screen passing, stuff like that. And the emphasis of what you need to be really good at is in touchdown to interception ratio and the completion percentage. And that, that has become a much more important stat, uh, you know, at the, at the college level than yards per attempt and adjusted yards per attempt. Um, so essentially you're going to find more quarterbacks, more successful quarterbacks by looking at touchdown to interception ratio and completion percentage. Then you're going to look at when it comes to yards per attempt and adjusting yards per attempt. Uh, and the better way to explain this is if you only cared about yards per attempt and adjusted yards per attempt, you would not hit on Tom Brady. You would not hit on Drew Brees. There are a lot of quarterbacks, and I'll just throw up a couple of these quarterbacks, who in college did not have good yards per attempt and adjusted yards per attempt. 
and ended up being some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL at the college level. Uh, so despite the fact that people will make this criticism about Derek Carr and say that, well, he's not great because of his yards per attempt, does the yards per attempt really matter anymore in the modern NFL? Where you look at quarterbacks like Tom Brady, Andrew Brees, uh, where their game is really built on short, quick, timing passes. You know, Drew Brees is, uh, sure, he throws deep. Uh, he, you know, he, he throws deep and he's gotten better in terms of as a deep thrower. Uh, Tom Brady's gotten better as a deep thrower as well. Uh, but as they've gotten older, they've also increased their sort of reliance on the short passing game. And, you know, and basically, again, yards per attempt is really just about the structure of the offense. It shouldn't be something that we judge quarterbacks on, you know, um, especially when things like touch and interception ratio and completion percentage are just much more impactful stats to look at. Uh, so that's the last sort of thing I wanted to bring up uh, in terms of Derek Carr, in terms of the, the discussion, is that people talk a lot of stuff about yards per attempt and try to hurt Derek Carr because of that. And I just don't think the criticism is fair. And I don't really think that that's really something you should be looking at when the fact is, is that Derek Carr is above average in the NFL when it comes to two stats that are super impactful at the quarterback position. Uh, you know, they're super important in terms of finding successful quarterbacks and the fact that he You know hits it out of the park when it comes to the stats that really matter Is something I think is much more important than how often his offense, you know, makes big plays down the football field uh, and Which I think is more so, uh, a, a, you know, an issue of the structure of the offense and how the offense is designed And also how the offense can survive with the types of athletes they have at the tackle position all of those sort of things so we went through a lot of stuff in this discussion and ultimately we have to come to a conclusion. Is Derek Carr worth $25 million a year uh, to be the quarterback of the Oakland Raiders, to be the highest paid quarterback, to be the highest paid player in the NFL? And I'm going to, I don't know if I'm really going to get backlash or not, or even how to approach this as well, because based on Derek Carr from his high school to college production, he was never exactly a generational prospect. And, and by generational, I'm talking about a prodigy, a Peyton Manning, uh, a uh, Otto Graham, uh, you know, t uh, Joe Montana. You know, I'm talking about that type of guy. A rare, super duper rare type of quarterback uh, that doesn't come out that often. Derek Carr doesn't really fit that profile from his high school and his college production, especially his college production. Derek Carr doesn't really fit that when it comes to his NFL production. You know, as I already showed you with his NFL stats, he's not exactly a guy that came into the NFL and immediately became an instant impact. Uh, you know, basically came into the NFL and then became a top five quarterback overnight. That isn't quite, he's had more of the sort of typical progression of a starting NFL quarterback when it comes to his stats. But I do think that he's an above average quarterback. And the question is, what do you do with an above average quarterback? It's tough to really say, you know, everybody needs a franchise quarterback. Everybody needs a quarterback that will just simply not mess up, that will run the offense and perform at a above average level and you don't need an elite quarterback to have a great football team either um, so I'm kind of torn on Derek Carr uh, on the one hand I do like the fact of the matter is he got paid 25 million dollars a year but there's gonna be another quarterback that gets a big payday and then he's gonna become the most paid player in the NFL you know like Dak Prescott's contract's gonna come up uh, you know, all these other sort of guys are going to come up and we're going to be having the same debate about, oh, he's overpaid and all this other kind of stuff. I don't really think you should view him being overpaid that way. All I would really say is that if you're upset that he's a, the highest paid quarterback in the NFL because he isn't even the best quarterback in the, in the NFL, I would agree with that. Uh, Derek Carr is not someone that, based on paper, based on what he's done in the NFL so far, uh, and also based on his college and high school production, He's not somebody that has the profile of someone that will ever become uh, the greatest quarterback in the NFL, uh, let alone a guy that will become a consistent top five quarterback long term. He's not Aaron Rodgers. He's not, you know, he's not that type of guy. He's not Tom Brady. He's not any of those types of guys or even Drew Brees for that matter. 
Um, he has more things in common with Andrew Luck uh, or Carson Palmer uh, or uh, I'm trying to think of uh, another sort of or Matt Ryan even. You know, he has more things in common with that type of guy, which is a good tier of player to be in. Like to have a Matt Ryan, to to have uh, a Carson Palmer when he was in his prime, to 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 have a above average quarterback in the NFL is a good thing. It just means that he's not exactly going to be elite. Um, and I know there's even talk about him being a top five quarterback, and that isn't really the case. Uh, none of his stats really show him as a top five quarterback. He's definitely a top 10 to top 16 quarterback, uh, but he's not exactly a top five quarterback based on his data and his other sort of stats. Um, so, which can improve, of course, again. The one thing I can give credit to Eric Carr about is he's consistently improved on his on his data, you know, from his rookie year to his uh, 2016 year. A lot of that also is because the team got better around him. But the bottom line is I don't really believe in the oh well the team got better and they carried Derek Carr. I, th I just think that's a load of stuff. Derek Carr is definitely a reason why this team uh, is recovering and is back to what it needs to be. But I do again. I just have some criticism. To people that just want to knee-jerk defend Derek Carr and say that he's the next greatest quarterback in the NFL based on paper and based on his data I would not say that's the case it could happen like I'm not denying that you know he could end up having a Brett Favre like career and just kind of blow it out of the water uh, but uh, I would say that you should just temper your expectations a little bit with him uh, because He's not the most perfect quarterback prospect ever. Um, he, in many ways, is kind of like a poor man's Aaron Rodgers, uh, which is a great compliment, to be honest. Uh, but he, but again, he's not Aaron Rodgers. He's a poor man's version of Aaron Rodgers. You know, if you just think about him stylistically and physically and all of those sort of stuff. Um, so that's the only main thing I would say uh, is: Do I think he's worth the amount of money that he's getting paid? I would say yes. He's a franchise quarterback. That's how much they get paid. You know, whether he's $2 million off or $3 million off, it doesn't really matter. He's the franchise. You you pay him what you pay franchise quarterbacks. And there's going to be another quarterback who's going to get paid even more than him, uh, you know, when he's still making his money. And then he'll pretty much at some point be about making as much money uh, as he really should be. So, uh, you know, in the future. So I, I would just say... Uh, just just enjoy the ride guys you know that's all I can really say uh, I think he has a good chance to keep improving on these numbers um, but I would just again some caution in terms of him because he, he still needs some development he still needs to clean up some things and I hope he does uh, he has a lot of potential to, to become an even better quarterback uh, but again I just don't from a data perspective he doesn't quite have a flawless composition to say yes he's going to be one of the greatest quarterbacks in the NFL you know a top five quarterback essentially um, so we'll see what happens but uh, th that's the only sort of main criticism I have of Derek Carr is that while he is good he's above average he's above average quarterback in the NFL but the top five talk is not on paper it doesn't really show up with him 100% yet and it, there's some things he definitely needs to improve upon up to this point. Uh, so I wouldn't really say he's overpaid. I would just say that you shouldn't be looking at how much he's being paid and then go, he's going to meet that in the future. He may not meet it. You know? So, uh, but yeah. So again, my name is James Coburn. Now you can find my work at draftcoburn.wordpress.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Geometrics. And if you like this content and you want more content like this, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Share this video as well. Uh, and I will talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.